And welcome everyone for another DNN Community Hangout. Uh, I'm here with uh, Will Stroll and Jared Shockley this month. Uh, Will, how's it going, man? What? What? I like my 8-bit glasses. <laughs> uh, everything's going good, man. How, how have you been over the last month? Been good. Things are things are smoking. We're uh, a lot of community stuff happening, so that's always always good. Uh, so always good to get back and and sort of do a hangout and see how see how the other half's living. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, this is kind of hard for you. I mean, you have to come down from the DNN pedestal to come talk to us. You know. <laughs> 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 oh man! So yeah, it's, it's good to be back on the on the hangout. Um, so we normally would now announce our next hangout, but uh, right now I'm looking for some more speakers. So uh, if you would like to be par participate in the next hangout, uh, or uh, you know, no matter how big or small your session idea is, uh, just let us know. Uh, we can uh, put you in next month, or you know, if you have to schedule out further than that, let us know, and we'd love to have you on the uh, the hangout. Uh, so uh, the next thing is uh, we're going to end up having a presentation. We're going to talk to somebody named Mr. Jared Shockley. Uh, but um, you know, do know that if you have any questions or comments or anything at all for us uh, in the Hangout uh, comment section below, if you're on uh, uh, the DNN site, uh, please feel free to ask questions there. And also we'll be monitoring uh, um, our respective Twitter accounts, so let us know what you have and hashtag a DNN Hangout, and we'll uh, ask it. So uh, at this point, we're going to uh, introduce Mr. Jared Shockley. Um, so Jared Shockley is a, a, a part of uh, Microsoft uh, for the second time. Uh, so and he's a 20-year veteran in the IT field, and, and, and he's uh, worked in all kinds of stuff and, and a lot of enterprise things, healthcare, and so on. And uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, Jared join us for today's Hangout. So welcome, Jared. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, it's a pleasure to be here, for sure. Yeah, so we we definitely had to you know kind of round this out. Uh, you know, we got three Microsoft guys on here now, uh, but uh, one official one. So we'll we'll be careful not to get you in trouble. You know, <laughs> I appreciate that. You know, uh, I've been, I I've, uh, just even to get the Hangout working, we had to download Chrome, and I know I set off probably some security people. Hey, why is he downloading Chrome? <laughs> yeah, they're gonna knock down your door in a minute. Exactly. Bang if I get tackled right all the time. now, like banging to get in. <laughs> <laughs> I better lock my door. That's a good point. I'll, uh... <laughs> Sergey is there out there, so we're going. Yeah, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Got another one from Microsoft. The malware has been dropped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. To be fair, I, I am using Chrome. Yeah, yep. I, I like it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, and I, and to be honestly fair, uh, my uh, default browser as of late is Opera, of all things. Mm -hmm. Um, well, interesting, that, interesting that you mentioned Opera. The guys who originally created Opera actually left and started a new browser company called Vivaldi uh, that I just downloaded and started playing with uh, yesterday. So, if you're an Opera fan, uh, go go give Vivaldi a try. It's still in beta. Um, doesn't have all the features that Opera used to have. But then Opera doesn't have all the features that Opera used to have. <laughs> so. No. The thing I like about Opera is it's got that Chromium engine uh, that is in Chrome, but it does like take strip out a lot of the Google um, claw, you know, the if you will, the the Google uh, links inside. So um, I, I I've been impressed with it with its speed. Um, it's you know modern and very easy to use. All my um, all my plugins work with it great, so it's like, wow, this is a uh, this. It, and, and I moved to Opera coming off of Firefox. Is kind of it. I of course still use IE a lot. Um, been playing with the new IE a little bit, so that's been interesting um, to see the change that they're going through, especially with the uh, new Edge configuration. So, you know, and the interesting it, now that we've gotten completely off on this tangent, the interesting thing is today, you know, the thing that everyone is, uh, associates with browsers is really the Chrome of the browser, right? It's like that's the thing that we identify. And the thing that's interesting with IE, uh, with the new IE, I think IE 11 or 12, I don't remember which numbers are now. Spartan. Uh, yeah, so the the interesting with, thing with Spartan is that it keeps the same Chrome and can swap out the engine underneath. So that that's 
actually quite uh, quite interesting how they do it. It is. Oh, I, you're talking about IE11 that is right. uh, in uh, Windows 10. Yeah, it, it can change yeah. out to use the Spartan engine or use the old engine. And the great thing about the old engine, it still works with all those old, funky... Uh, internal corporate sites that people still have to, oh, I gotta still have IE7 installed to run this thing because it's this app that we bought 10 years ago and they're not willing to upgrade it. And you right. see that a lot, I hate to say it, you see that a lot in the healthcare industry. Yeah, so. it's just, it's it's like Microsoft is the, the, the opposite of where the rest of the industry is where they all use the same rendering engine but they all put different Chrome around it, right, and all the and Microsoft's got two rendering engines now, and it's and, and actually it's it's a fork of Trident. So that you're talking right. about the Trident engine, and that's one of the interesting things. I know we're not getting on Azure here. This is a lot of IE talk, but uh, it's great <laughs> because it's the uh, Trident engine, and what they've done is forked it and made a lot of streamlining so that it's less uh, bulky and it doesn't have a lot of that. So I'm going to be interested to see how it operates going forward for people. Well, now that we've gotten done with that tangent, I think we've uh, uh, all expressed our favorite browsers. <laughs> oh, boy. So we are talking to Jared. So he obviously has some uh, uh, Internet browser uh, knowledge, uh, but we did bring him on to talk about some uh, DNN and, and, and Azure stuff. But before we do that, I did want to kind of talk to him about, you know, why he's here and how he got here and things like that. Um, so first of all, we uh, it looks like people can find you at Jared on Tech. Dot com. Is that your primary website? That is. That's my primary blog, obviously running on .NET Nuke on Azure. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that. And you're also, for the blog, I noticed you're using live blog. I was curious as to what uh, choice, uh, you know, what, what was the deciding factor for that? It started a long time ago when uh, LiveWriter was just came out. I wanted a good blog engine that worked with LiveWriter natively. Um, got very interested in what Mandeep was doing and have stayed with them and progressed with them and liked a lot of the tools that they put out. So they've been uh, they've been my primary third party provider in a lot of ways. I uh, I really like their blog a lot. I uh, when the the DNN core blog went uh, kind of dormant for a little while, um, I needed to find an alternative because I didn't I didn't have the time to keep that up myself. Um, and, and so I, I switched to a Mandeep Live blog, and, and uh, I haven't looked back. It's it's a very good tool. I, I agree. So you've been using DNN since version two X. That's yes. pretty good. That's yeah, pretty good. I've, I've been. In fact, I used it way back when Access. You could use it with an Access backend <laughs> engine. <laughs> so 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 we have a term for people like that 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 uh, people like Chris and myself use. We call them newbies. <laughs> uh oh! Looks like we might have lost Jared for we a second. Lost, we lost. Uh, we lost Jared. He knew, he knew you were going to insult him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, yeah, I can't interview you. Oh, here we go. They caught on to me. They caught on to me, guys. <laughs> it's okay. The only thing you missed was uh, was uh, uh, Joe insulting you. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I heard the newbies comment, by the way. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. So, uh, how did you originally come across DNN? Uh, was it because of Access? <laughs> uh, no. Oh, God, no. Uh, <laughs> I only used the Access part back then because it was uh, cheap on my uh, hosting company to get Access databases versus SQL databases. But I, I first started out actually in PHP Nuke, and just was not happy with it. Um, really didn't like what the um, the offering was and then you know I was primarily a Microsoft person I'd done a whole bunch of ASP uh, back in back in the day this is way back in the day ASP development with a uh, SQL and access backends and there's this cool thing I, uh, there's you know dot net nuke I'm like what's this um, you know I hadn't spent a lot of time in the dot net area yet and started diving in and wow did I like what I saw and I know it was based uh, off the uh, original kind of project, but wow, did they take it in a new direction? I loved what they, the direction that they, uh, that it was taken by the uh, uh, back then. It was the uh, open source uh, team, and it's just amazing what was created and the flexibility and the, you know, for me, I didn't have to create. I used, I've built CMS engines. 
Um, so I know what it's like. And wow, to be able to just have this modular system and find all these modules and then say, okay, you know what? None of these meet my needs. So I'm going to build my own. And it was very easy to build things. So it was all in all, it was a great platform. So was there any specific feature that like really won you over? Because right? you, know, you, you mentioned pretty much everything that, that is a strength of DNN. But was there any specific thing that you're like, wow, okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting loose. I'm going over there. Um, it was all, uh, primarily around the fact that I didn't have to make all the modules. <laughs> I'll be frank. <laughs> I could go out and buy these third-party modules. I could buy, you know, the DNN back then came with a lot of great, still come with a lot of great modules. You can build almost any site with just the built-in modules. But man, mm -hmm. then you can go find those custom modules and just make it pop. And, and, and as a second uh, area, I would say probably the skinning capability. Um, .NET Nuke has been one of the easiest to skin CMSs that I've seen around. I know a lot of people are big on WordPress and this, and of course my daily job, I use that uh, Microsoft technology, that's that real big one that might be pointing at some share. <laughs> and it's tough to try and do any sort of branding or any sort of look and feel on top of them. Yeah. The, um, so uh, at, well, it looks like in 2005 you joined Microsoft. Uh, what were you doing before Microsoft? Uh, before Microsoft, I ran my own company in Montana with a business partner. We developed websites. Back then, I didn't. Uh, it was before I got into .NET Nuke. Um, I, that's where I built my own CMS engines. We built uh, some pretty major websites for Southwest Montana, and we were probably the big fish in the little pond. And I just wanted to kind of grow past that. Moved out to Seattle. Um, got some jobs working in data centers because uh, you know my main skill set is Windows Server, SQL Server. Web dev, um, so I, you know, I, I got plugged into a, a, a data center and I was working as a tier two systems administrator for them. They called mm -hmm. them webmasters, but uh, <laughs> and I was primarily uh, my primary job was all the SQL servers. So I was making sure the SQL server stayed up. And then I got an offer to come over and join Microsoft, and uh, haven't looked back since. <laughs> well, that's definitely <laughs> something I wanted to drill down into. Like, like, how did that offer come to you? Oh, the offer came to me as, uh, you know, I had, I had my resume out. Back then, it was the big thing was on Monster, and, you know, somebody saw my resume on Monster, and they said, hey, we have this position over in uh, Finance IT. I was like, oh, cool, Finance IT. A lot of SQL Server. That's my big background. Great. They brought me in. I uh, interviewed um, with a couple of the uh, full-time employees. They uh, felt I would fit well with the team got in and was working as a vendor. So at Microsoft, there's full-time employees and vendors. The vendors do a lot of the grunt work, and the full-time employees are doing a lot of meetings. The <laughs> the, uh, I, was doing, uh, I was doing the job for about a month, and the uh, group manager came by my office and said, hey, you're doing some great. By the way, you should look on our career website and just by chance look at this job ID number. Well, it was for a job on the team. So then I applied, and a couple of uh, long loop of interviews later, <laughs> that was back when uh, Microsoft still did uh, the long loop of interviews where you had uh, five, six interviews, and one long burned out day, and, but uh, in the end, they uh, extended me an offer, and I was uh, working as a full-time employee in finance IT, running tax, the tax data warehouse for Microsoft. Wow, the, the infamous uh, interview gauntlet. <laughs> yes. And I even got some of the funky questions of if you have two people entering a tunnel, and this was the actual one I got, and uh, they get about two fifths down the tunnel, and the uh, and a train, they hear a train coming, and they both go each direction, and the train barely misses both. How fast was the train going? So I did, and I was under a little bit of pressure. I'm like, I'm doing. You know, my math teacher would be like, come on, Jared, this is like the train, let's go. <laughs> so. Sound like you had a question, Joe. No, no, I, I'm just uh, just listening for the moment. <laughs> so, uh, the uh, Jared, it looked like you had a, a period of time where you uh, kind of branched out from Microsoft. Uh, I didn't write yeah. down which company it was, but uh, well, uh, what was it like leaving Microsoft to go work somewhere else? It was a very interesting change for me. I mean, Microsoft is a very distinct uh, environment and lifestyle for its employees. Going to a wholly different company, for instance, I was director of IT there, 
and it was a healthcare company. So I had to dress like in slacks every day, dress shirt. It wasn't until like the last couple months where we finally got the dress code relaxed where we could like maybe wear jeans as long as I had my sport coat and the dress shirt on. Um, but uh, you know, I was uh, and any time I went to a hospital, suit had to wear a suit. And I thought to myself, oh my god, I became a suit. <laughs> <laughs> I became the enemy. <laughs> yeah. No, no respective geek would uh, want to wear that. <laughs> no, exactly. But the fun yeah. thing working there was they had a, this external website, all static HTML. They paid like five hundred dollars a change to have this thing changed. I'm like, can we get a content management system here, please? And I kn happen to know a great one. And so that's I actually they they run .NET Nuke as well. So I've introduced them to it, and I still kind of help them here and there. But their ma their uh, marketing department can do most of the work, which is great for them. They don't need a they don't need anyone in IT. The irony in that whole in that whole uh, conversation there, Jared, is that uh, that you go back to Microsoft and you have people like Scott Guthrie and and Satya Nadala, uh, you know, who I've never seen either one of those guys in a suit. And I and I rarely see them dressed in in, in anything very dressed up, so it's <laughs> kind of kind of interesting. It is. Sach is wearing a couple, you know, more suits lately. He is wearing more suits. Uh, when when he needs to be the suit, he be he's the suit. But uh, there's he has a monthly internal kind of. Uh, web chat for everyone, all the employees that we can watch, and typically he's wearing jeans and a dress shirt. So. I'm a little dressed down today. <laughs> so, so would it be safe to say that uh, the, the, you wanted to go back to the culture, uh, it, it, and that's part of the reason you went back to Microsoft? Actually, uh, I'll, I'll be quite frank. A lot of the reason why I came back is I was director of IT. Half of my job was compliance and auditing. Uh, about a quarter of my job was HR, and a quarter of my job was admin slash budget. There was no room for technical work. I did technical work at home at night. I, you know, I have a, I have a three-server Hyper-V uh, um, cluster at my house that I r used to run all my websites on and everything. So I was doing everything at home. I had, you know, all these systems to keep myself up to date with uh, the technology. I got an offer to come back to Microsoft to be a technical person. I am a senior service engineer for the SharePoint on-prem environment. So. I'm doing technical things almost every day. I'm still in a lot of meetings, but I, I get to do technical stuff. I get to play with servers. I get to play with, you know, uh, install bits, try things. And one of the biggest areas I got to spend a lot of time is in Azure. So that's where I became got a lot of background in Azure. Yeah, so, so we're getting to that segue. So uh, the, you know, some of the things you said is, like, you deliver operations and solutions to mid-sized healthcare organizations, data center operations, business and systems consulting, web development, enterprise-focused IT operations management. Um, that is covering a big gamut of stuff, right? Uh, so I was curious is, is you know, with, with having all those kind of on your resume, so to speak, how do you keep up with it all? Uh, the big thing about it is got to keep up reading. Um, you got to spend time in... Uh, Events uh, like uh, the .NET Nuke conference. Uh, I'm, can't, I'm trying to remember when it is. Um, sorry, I, I, I wish I was going this year. Um, I can't remember the month that it's in. But going to conferences like that, watching webinars like this, watching podcasts. Um, I have a consistent uh, 12 podcasts that I watch every week. Plus, I have uh, I use a service called Newsblur, which is a news uh, news feed aggregator. And I pull in, uh, in fact, I've been meaning to write a post on my blog about this. I follow, I think, 49 different blogs watching for uh, information being published about technologies. And one of the big ones when it comes to Azure is obviously the Azure product group. But then there's a whole bunch of people around it um, that uh, speak uh, a lot on Azure. And so those are people I follow as well and get the news from them. So the, the, the last uh, the question I have, and, and this, this I guess would be, oh, actually, you know what, uh, we'll save that question to when we get to your actual part of the presentation. We should probably uh, transition into news at this point. What do you think, Joe? Unless you have yeah. a question. Yeah. No, we're running a little bit behind this month, but that's okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so some of the news. The first thing uh, is uh, since our last meeting, Joe has gotten one year older. 
<laughs> Happy yeah. birthday, Joe. Happy well, belated birthday. I'm thinking since the last meeting, I'm really only one month older, but fair enough. <laughs> the, the counter, Semantics. The counter ticked over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, another thing to uh, mention out there is uh, uh, the DNN book is still on its way. Um, so the current release date is for May 11th. So you can uh, 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 you can pre-order that now from uh, uh, Amazon if you'd like. And uh, there's a Bitly link for it. So Bitly slash DNN Seven Book if you want to get there easy. Otherwise, just search for it. Um, uh, the training group, so I happen to be leading that, uh, so there's the training DNN working group where um, you know, we're responsible for anything that basically helps give people more information, so that like this, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, event included, but any type of event that's uh, DNN related, any documentation, videos, um, user groups, you know, and if you want to help with any of that, uh, please let me know. We're about to schedule our first uh, online meeting as a group uh, within the next two weeks or so, uh, and I'm just looking for some uh, uh, new volunteers, and, and, and some of that should hopefully realize that it's not technical to write some of the documentation and whatnot, so and no matter what your skill set is, uh, there, we, we have something that you can uh, help, work, help us work on, so uh, let me know if you want to participate in that. Um, there's a few blogs to highlight. Um, so uh, a couple blogs I, I like to uh, that I, I started seeing was by uh, Beth. Um, she's uh, uh, highlighting some community members. That's pretty cool. So there's a, a blog about, um, and I think I'll get his name wrong, but is it Jan Jonas or? <laughs> yeah, <I just laughs> you, you know what I'm Yeah, Jan. It's the spell Jan. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure I'm butchering it, but uh, yeah. Yeah, him and Brian Dukes. Uh, there's a nice call to action out there by um, by Ernst Peter. Uh, there's a blog out there called Show Me Your Skin where he's uh, putting a challenge out there to have the next DNN default skin put together. So if you're interested in, in having your work highlighted as a, the, the default skin that comes out when you install DNN, uh, you know, check out that blog uh, and, and uh, we'll, of course, put all these things in the show notes. Um, let's see here. Uh, the, there's a, a nice blog about uh, also by the same guy uh, about uh, moving some extension source code to GitHub. Uh, so that's uh, uh, letting you know where some of the source code for some of the core modules is going. Um, I also noticed uh, some open source extension releases. Uh, there was a B2B tweet or BTB tweet. Uh, so it's a nice Twitter module to you know display a Twitter feed on your site. Uh, so apparently that stuff's coming back. Um, the Turbo Scripts by uh, uh, Sebastian uh, and uh, Chris Hammond had another release of his Hammerflex skin as well. Uh, let's see here. We had some commercial. I didn't see a whole lot of commercial like like announcements, unfortunately. But uh, Onyx Tech had a number of releases this month, and they have a beta release of a, 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 an iPhone um, app that integrates with uh, Hotcakes. Um, so that's pretty cool. And then some of the releases, uh, their modules are integrating with Hotcakes as well. So like their help desk system. Uh, so if you want to attach your help desk to your e-commerce, um, uh, they got that uh, uh, that integration going for you. Um, and then of course, you know. Got to mention hotcakes, even though I just did. Uh, you know, one of the things we launched recently that uh, we're ready to talk about. We launched this in December, but uh, we have a hosted trial. So if you want to try out hotcakes, you don't even have to install anything. You just go in there, fill out the form, click a button, and you can try out the module. Isn't that nice? That is that is awesome. I, you know, I like uh, when companies offer that. Um, you know, whether it's DNN or any of the the vendors in our ecosystem. I think one of the things that that when you go to the store, you know, I think that the uh, skin vendors have been doing this for a long time. Um, the ability to go and actually see these things in action uh, just really helps in the sales process. So I'm glad to mm -hmm. see Hotcakes doing that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one thing I've liked about the DNN community as well is, you know, there's a lot of people that put out trials and uh, limit, you know, either trials or, hey, try it on our site. So that's that's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. there are certainly a lot of our vendors that are uh, that have uh, you can install it and run it in local host, uh, and then you only need the license when you actually go into production. So that's that's also the other way I've seen it done really well. But not having to do any installs and just click a button um, that really is nice. Now, do you guys pre-populate that with data, Will? Um, so we have sample data. Um, once you have it installed, there's a, a you know like a, a nice little helper thing that tells you the next steps to go through. And uh, into those next steps, uh, you can it's a one-click button to install some uh, uh, sample data. So um, so yeah, we have we have all that ready for folks. But but the power in doing something like this, I mean, it's nice to have a local host install. 
but that still requires somebody to have a site to test on, and that person would, in most cases, need to be a technical person, right? right. <laughs> the, the, the person that's actually going to buy the module is not necessarily the technical person. Um, and so this is a, a very nice for anybody to be able to just try it out. Uh, what else? Uh, so we got uh, 1.8 in beta in the hotcakes side as well. And if anybody wants to help test our beta, you know, just uh, let me know. Uh, and this brings us to our site showcase. So we, we missed this last month. Uh, let me uh, show my screen real quick. Uh, oops. I can't switch the tab until I show my screen. See, now you're just you showing off because because you know the problems that Jared's been having. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, that, that's not the reason. Oh, man. <laughs> Every month we're supposed to be showing one of these. <laughs> Being able to sh uh, share a screen would be nice. Yes, uh, we'll, we'll get to that uh, limitation in just a second. But uh, uh, the folks uh, uh, at Inno Software, so you might remember them as our presenters from last month. Uh, but uh, the uh, actually, I think the month before that maybe. Uh, but the, they built this site, uh, Northspan.ca. So it's a Canadian site and, and it has a nice little video in the front and everything. And they of course implemented all those things that we talked about during that presentation. Where in the back end, you can barely tell it's DNN. Um, and, and it's it's a nice site to put together, nice white white space and, and great uh, graphics. It's very usable, easy to get through. It's of course responsive using Bootstrap three. Um, they also used uh, uh, something called Tiny PNG to compress the PNG file, so it loads really really fast. Um, they've used uh, some of the modules they used as far as DNN modules include the DNN Sharp URL adapter, uh, DNN Sharp Action Forms, Too Sexy Content. Uh, that seems to be a popular thing these days, uh, and the Forty Fingers Style Helper object. And so that's some of the formula they talked about in their presentation. And um, uh, basically, the entire homepage, for the most part, was all the sections are built using Too Sexy Content. So that's pretty interesting. Um, so it's a nice little site. You know, check it out if you want. All right. So uh, to that end, uh, at this point, uh, you know, uh, do, do you have any news, uh, 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 Joe or, or Jared? Anything yeah, so, that you'd like to put up? So yeah. So there's a couple of things. Uh, we do have the uh, the DNN Connect that's coming up here at the end of May uh, in uh, in France. Um, actually, uh, uh, Malau, I think, is the the name of the, the town or resort where that's going to be at. Um, so if you have questions about that, we'll put put the link in the in the show notes. It's dnnconnect.org, dnn-connect.org, uh, slash 2015, I believe. But we'll get yes. we'll get the right link in the show notes. Um, and I think uh, having talked to uh, to the guys there, that that we're getting very close to running out of uh, room. We do have limitations yes. on how many. Uh, rooms we can get at the resort. So if you were even remotely thinking about going, uh, you better make a decision fast. Uh, we'll probably only by the end of this week, I expect uh, we'll be we'll be booked solid. So uh, should be a pretty good event. A uh, couple of the things that we're going to be talking about there, but that you'll be able to see some of it uh, maybe before then is uh, DNN 7.5. Um, so we just finished. Uh, a sprint on DNN 7.5. Most of the MVC work is done. Uh, we do plan to have a CTP next week, uh, so people will be able to play with the MVC bits in DNN, uh, which, uh, quite honestly, I, I, I've been looking at this stuff for the last several weeks with, uh, with Charles as we go through the MVC stuff, and I think people are going to be really shocked at, at how close we have been able to uh, adhere to normal MVC development. So when you're doing MVC in DNN, uh, it, it's going to be very much the same as, as what you were doing outside of DNN. We didn't have to, there wasn't really a lot of work in order to make the two things uh, work together. There are a couple of places where we had to inherit from a, from a common base class, but for the most part, uh, if it's MVC, it's just going to work in DNN. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really interested in getting that out in the community and, and getting some feedback on that, getting some people playing with it. We're actually going to be uh, rewriting the HTML module to use the, uh, to, to use the MVC uh, and also to incorporate the, uh, the workflow API that uh, came out in 7.4.0. Uh, so, so expect that CTP to drop uh, next week sometime. Uh, also, uh, 7.4.1, we've got uh, two more weeks until code freeze. 
uh, and then we'll have the 741 official release will go out uh, uh, mid-April. Uh, so those those are a couple of big things uh, that, that I'm focused on right now, obviously 741 and 75 uh, being the real big things. And then once we get past 75 or as we get a little bit closer here towards uh, DNN Connect, uh, we'll start talking more and more about DNN Next, uh, which is uh, going to be based on ASP.NET 5 and, and DNX, which is the, the new name uh, that they have for some of the, the core tooling for, for ASP.NET 5. So uh, if you didn't check out the ASP.NET Hangout, uh, if, if you're not following along with those every week, I, I highly recommend that Hangout. Scott Hanselman, it, Scott Hanselman does that Hangout. Uh, so you can probably just go to YouTube and, and look up Scott Hanselman and ASP.NET, and you'll find the Hangouts pretty easily. Uh, we can we can get a link to those in the show notes. But uh, uh, speaking of which, uh, Microsoft is actually sending uh, uh, Elon Lipton is coming over to DNN Connect, and he's going to be giving a keynote uh, for us at DNN Connect, and we're excited to that that uh, uh, we were able to get someone from the ASP.NET team to come out and, and talk to talk to the crowd about uh, some of the things that we're working on with Microsoft for uh, for DNN Next. So. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a great event. Uh, you're basically, there's two different keynotes. You're one of them, all right? And, and then we have uh, Microsoft doing a keynote, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, and, and the dates for DNN Connect is from May 28th through the 31st, and that's in South France. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're going to go, don't just register, but also start looking at your travel, too, because, you know, you can't fly right into that city. You have to fly around it and then and then travel right into it. Um, and, and the timing for that is interesting, because that's going to come right after the DNN book launch. So... Bring your book. You, there's going to be a few authors there, I'm sure, uh, and you can get some uh, signed books set while you're there. We're actually hoping to uh, to have some books at the event. Uh, working with Wiley to try to get some shipped over. Uh, timing is going to be a little close, so we don't know exactly how many we're going to get there. But uh, um, I do believe Wiley is going to try to get us some to to ship over there. So. Yeah, I had my events at the top of the news, and then I just worked through the news because I was excited to like say your birthday first, and then I started moving down. Uh, so there's another event I, I didn't, I wasn't able to mention either. I'm going to be in Fresno next week at the .NET user group uh, talking about DNN. And so we're going to go over some uh, module development techniques and best practices and things. And so that's next Thursday. So if you're in the Fresno area, look up the uh, uh, Central .NET uh, user group. Uh, I'll, I'll be there in person. So uh, you know, uh, look forward to seeing everybody there. Uh, Jared, do you have any news? Well, I got a couple of items of, uh, of note. Um, obviously, Build is sold out. Uh, Microsoft Build, which is a big developer conference in San Francisco. Um, I do believe they are going to uh, make a lot of the content available live uh, streaming via uh, the Channel 9 system as well as uh, available after the event. So if you're unable to go or didn't get, you know, I think it was an hour or hour and a half and it was sold out, if you couldn't get in line to go or can't go to San Francisco, this is a good way to get that uh, content. And like I said, it's, they're going to be covering a lot of the ASP.next uh, or ASP.net v5 and dot, uh, the dot next of a lot of our platforms. So it's a good place to go. An, uh, a great alternative to build if you're more uh, enterprise focused as well as want to get into other technologies would be uh, Microsoft Ignite in Chicago. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, 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 spots open. Uh, I myself, I'm going to Ignite. Um, there's going to be a lot of speakers there on s many, many, many subjects. And the big, the big thing that you get at Ignite is you get the breadth. So you could go in the morning to do dev, and then you can in the afternoon talk to SQL people. And then if, if because you may have a uh, system that uh, interconnects with SharePoint, you can go to SharePoint the next day, or you can talk to the Windows client team or System Center. It, it, being, you know, my career has been a lot of uh, generalist. So I've, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat in-depth in, depth in uh, SharePoint, but I'm also in-depth in SQL. But I also kind of manage, have managed clients, I've managed System Center, I've managed all these other systems. And a conference like Ignite allows me to go and just have fun and say, oh, okay, I want to talk about this, I want to talk about this. And I know in the past, uh, .NET Nuke's been at the Tech Eds. I don't know if they're going to be at Ignite this summer, but uh, they've been at Tech Eds before. Yeah, we weren't planning on doing Ignite. We were actually trying to get in at Build, um, and and uh, both Charles and myself had, had started the sign-up process, and we got in maybe 
10 minutes after they opened the sign up process uh, and by the time we got registration filled out uh, it was over it was sold out so in literally in 20 minutes uh, they were they were sold out this year it was wow. incredibly fast so what did you learn um, I learned that uh, that the events team at Microsoft did not have enough capacity for people to get in because you spend a lot of time even even when you're filling out the forms uh, you spend a lot of time just looking at the at, at a wait uh, at a wait icon you know for the next <laughs> form page to load. Uh, okay, <laughs> I was trying to I was trying to make this your fault somehow. Because <laughs> he was using Chrome. Yeah, it was it was. Not the fastest I've seen a conference sell out. There's one here locally uh, that sells out in about two minutes. I mean, people are literally just waiting at their browser for the thing to open up because they know it just it sells out instantly. Code Mash, uh, a regional conference, but they probably have 1,200 people or so there every year, and they sell out. Uh, it's it's incredible to watch. Well, with that being said, I think it's time to transition into uh, Jared's presentation. I should do air quotes, presentation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, there's something going on on his, on his end, so he's not going to be able to show anything, but we're going to talk about DNN and Azure. Um, and so there were some actual interesting segues into this. Like, for example, the host of trials that we have at, at Hotcakes, they're using Windows Azure Pack. So it's not Azure itself, but it is a flavor of Azure. Um, so it, it's, uh, you know, it's 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 getting out there everywhere. Azure is becoming quite popular. Why do you think that is, Jared? Well, a lot of it is, uh, especially when you talk about the hosted Azure, where Microsoft does the hosting. It's they don't have to do a lot of management. Uh, one of the slides I actually was going to only show uh, one uh, PowerPoint slide, but it was a great slide. It shows all the different layers, if you will. Uh, when you talk about networking, you talk about uh, you talk about networking. You talk about um, the server, hardware, storage. The operating system, your application, all this, the, the whole stack. With Azure, you can say, I want to host this part. Like with IaaS, you could say, yeah, okay, give me a virtual machine. I'll still manage the, the OS and up. Or you could go with the PaaS, the platform as a service, and say, I just want a website running on an IIS server. And I don't want to have to manage that. And that's where actually I run my personal uh, website and blog is on uh, PaaS, both for website and SQL. So it, it it's interesting as far as that's concerned. So yeah. so uh, I was just wanted to take a step back on that one real quick. Uh, when you say pass, what does that mean to somebody who might not be familiar with that term? So platform as a service, also known as PaaS, uh, it basically means you get some sort of platform you can run on top of. In the case of Microsoft uh, with uh, websites, it's going to be an IIS server. You you get access to a web root. You can plug in any web code. You can plug in ASP.NET. You can plug in PHP. Um, you can, uh, you know, it's it's a lot of freedom. Here's the thing: as administrators, you don't have to manage that IIS server. That IIS server is patched by the team, uh, by by the Azure team. So monthly patches, you don't have to worry about. As long as things like storage is up, and we've had a problem in the past, uh, we had a pretty major outage back in November where we lost storage worldwide, and it was uh, caused uh, you know major sites to go down that were using the uh, Azure PaaS. But if the if storage stays up, all those sites keep running. I get personally on my site, I get alerts uh, probably twice a week, and I, I'll get an alert saying your site has a 500 error. Your site's fine. And I look at my phone and I just kind of laugh because basically they've moved my site from one set of servers to another set of servers. And because I don't have, right now I'm only running what they call single instance, so I have no fault tolerance. Every time they move my site to a new server, I actually see it with an alert. Yeah, you know, the, the interesting thing is you talk about the fault tolerance and, and, and some of that, Jared, is that I don't think for many people they they realize how many levels of fault tolerance uh, and redundancy are built into something like a PaaS service, right? We all think about, oh, well, there's redundancy at the server, but you forget that there's redundancy at the router, there's redundancy at all these different 
even down to the power supplies. I remember uh, yeah. many, many years ago uh, going and, and interviewing at a company and and they had this massive uh, Windows NT server and the server was running a million dollars and it's because every subsystem in the server had these redundancies, whether it was power supplies, network cards, you name it, everything was redundant. And Azure and, and these cloud infrastructure sort of give you that as part of that. And it's all sort of hidden from the user, right? It is, and you know, I will say that AWS has a lot of similarities in how they run everything. So it, when you're talking cloud services as PaaS, it's all, they, they try and make everything redundant the way Microsoft has done it. Uh, you, some of you may have seen it. You can actually go and look at our uh, uh, the Microsoft.com website, and I believe it's under Advanced Data Center. We actually bring in these containers that are about, they're a half-size container, from like a container truck. You see those you know, the typical truck with a 53-foot trailer that's a container that just goes on the container ship. Well, we have these half containers, and they can literally drive them into the data center, pull it off the truck, lock it into place, attach power, attach water for cooling if necessary, because some of our data centers no longer require uh, water for cooling. They have enough cooling systems around it, and plug in that uh, big fiber uh, connector, and away they go. They've got a brand new, you know, I believe they have, I, I can't remember, I think it's 18 racks or more inside this unit, all pre-built, everything's pre-wired, all with these connectors, and uh, away it goes, and you have now capacity, brand new capacity. It's, it's amazing what, what's being done with those kind of standards, and then when you put these virtualization layers on top of it, it makes a lot of standards. Um, Something that came out, Microsoft is working with a whole bunch of folks in uh, an open standard for uh, standardized networking layers so that it doesn't matter if you have a Cisco or a Huawei router or all these different router manufacturers that all have their own, uh, 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 their own languages, their own CLIs to manage them. They're trying to put a virtualization layer on top of them, and we've been working because of Azure, and I believe Amazon's working in the same working group, trying to get the standard to make networking standardized across that layer so that you can say, I want these IPs to go to these servers over here. So there's several different flavors of Azure. Um, uh, for somebody that's that's kind of new to what Azure is, uh, what are the different flavors that somebody can get involved in, it, and why would they want to choose one of those. So, and that's a uh, great question, Will. The, the big thing with Azure is there's uh, uh, there's many, the, the many flavors are PaaS. So that's just platform as a service. I can set up a website, I can set up a database, and one of the interesting things, I wanted to show it off because it's the coolest thing. If you go in and you, uh, you look in our catalog um, and you say, I want to create a new site, and you go into our marketplace or into the new and I say I want to do a website. Uh, I wish I could show this because one of the things right on top here is DNN platform. So we actually have it scripted out, and I th I don't know if uh, I I don't know for certain. Joe, you might be able to answer this for me. Is this uh, something that D uh, DNN worked with the Azure team? Yeah. So we actually uh, deliver for the the web app gallery a uh, deployment package. Uh, which is just a standard IIS deployment package, mm -hmm. so that you could actually load it into any IIS. They've just yep. scripted out some additional bits to load it into Azure, and yep. it's the same package you use for a web platform installer, right? Exactly. Uh, additional tests on the Azure side to make sure you can load it, but we just we auto build that as one of the artifacts when we're doing when we're doing our builds, and so it's just one more package type for us that comes out. Exactly. And within a few minutes, by clicking that button, I can have a brand new site up, which is incredible when you really think about that. I can create a site like that. And uh, one of the great things about it is, I, you know, you might have, oh, I have a client I need to meet next week, and we need to give them some sort of, uh, some sort of uh, preview of what we're going to do for them. Boom, you could spin up a DNN platform, plug in your modules, plug in your skin, get your content kind of worked out the way you want it. You can have a site up. I've been able to build sites with that in probably two hours, maybe three. It's amazing the capability that that has, and it creates the IIS website and paths, 
and it also creates a SQL database in the PaaS SQL. So you get the advantage of both being in PaaS. You don't have to manage a SQL server. Plus, you don't have to license a SQL server. And having been on the outside for four years, man, oh, man, I walked in my first day at the, at the uh, uh, radiology practice I worked at, and I said, hey, I want to, you know, let's get me set up with this and this and this. And they go, do you realize how much that is to license all that, Jared? And I'm like, um, no. <laughs> you know, we forget that here at Microsoft. It costs a lot. Whereas all that is included when you, when, you know, the SQL licensing is all included with the PaaS solution. Now, I'll even say if you go into the IaaS in the virtual machines, and let's say you want to run everything as virtual machines, so that's IaaS, infrastructure as a service. You're going to patch the OS yourself. You're going to maintain everything from that OS layer up, but they're going to manage, the high, if you will, the hypervisor and below, the hardware and the networking. One of the things that you get when you click on that SQL server, so let's say I'm going to, I'm going to uh, uh, get myself just a regular Windows server for my um, web servers, but then there's an offering inside the, inside the gallery for a SQL server. It's actually at a higher rate than a standard server, and people have been like, why is that so much higher? It's higher because it includes the SQL licensing for the server. You don't have to license the, the SQL server. Again, you have to have your CALs if you're going to be connecting applications, other applications to that. But the SQL server is there. It's licensed. You don't have to go back and re rethink the licensing, if you will. So it's a, it's a huge advantage of being able to run in the cloud. You know, the one thing I would, I would say, you know, and, and it's a great capability to be able to spin those things up really quickly, the, the flip side of that, and, and just uh, um, ran into a situation recently where someone I know uh, inadvertently spun up a new SQL Server Enterprise Edition in the cloud uh, and didn't realize the cost associated with doing that. You know, and it's like, you can spin the things up really quickly, uh, but that also means you have to be careful because you can incur costs very quickly, right? You don't exactly. accidentally install SQL Server Enterprise on premise. You know that that's a very intentional thing. In the cloud, one one edition versus the other is is just which button you click, right? Exactly. I will admit I fr have ran into this myself. Uh, one of the things I run is I don't actually I you know my personal device that I use other than my desktop is my Surface Pro three. Great little machine, love it to death. I don't want to try and run Visual Studio on there. It, uh, it's a, you know, Visual Studio is a beast. I actually created a VM up in Azure on the IaaS, and this is also one of the uh, um, uh, the catalogs, uh, one of the items out of the catalog. Who you can actually get Visual Studio pre-installed. It's all installed, ready to go. And so that's where I run my Visual Studio, and I had what they called an A3. It's a, it's a certain size server. Um, trying to remember the size offhand. It was like a four-core, seven-gig of RAM, I believe. You know, and it costs a lot, so, but I was able to start and stop it. So when I wanted to do some de dev work, I would start it, use it, and then when I was done, I'd stop it. I decided to upgrade it to the new D series. So we have our new D series servers, for those of you who don't know. Uh, they're bigger. They have more, more RAM. Uh, they run on SSDs. They run fully on Intel Xeon. The uh, A series runs on a combination of Intel uh, Xeon, low-end Intel Xeon, and AMD uh, chips. But the uh, uh, D series run on the uh, a big Xeon system, and I left it on. And three days later, I got a notification that my site was offline from my monitoring system. I'm like, why is my site offline? I go and look in Azure. I'm like. You're out of credits. I'm like, I'm out of credits? Why am I out of credits? Oh, I've been running that server for three days, and I lost all my credits. So. <laughs> so a lot of what you're saying is resonating with some things, some pains that I've had in the past. And, 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 and like, I've been that guy that's, that's responsible for the site, and, and 2 o'clock in the morning, those alerts go off, and, and, and you try to log in, and you can't, and you have to you know, put on your clothes and go into the data center and, and figure out what's going on. And 24 hours later, after you call some techs in and you get some hardware replaced, like it all works. Uh, you know, it, when you're using a, a platform or infrastructure as a service, you know, those types of things, you, you don't have to be that guy anymore. Right. <laughs> you only get the phone call when this whole service is offline. And trust me, when the whole service is offline, 
there are people scrambling around Microsoft. I know the uh, the incident we had. Um, they've really thought through what they did wrong, and they've changed. They actually changed the whole processes of how they deploy code because of that. And it's amazing to see that modern engineering. You know, a lot of people call it DevOps, but they have a, a very quick cycle, very quick sprints. And they were able to throw in the sprint of not only changing how they, you know, the, the coding, the code deployment system, but also the process, because that was a part of the sprint. How do we change the process? Who can check this off and say this is done? And Mark Rosinovich gave a great um, response uh, on Channel 9 talking about that outage and what they've changed. So uh, it's something I would go into Channel 9 and look for. But the... Uh, when it comes back to what it, what Azure can offer to, especially DNN, I, I take a look at things like the PaaS service, but there's things past just, hey, I can host a website. We've got a whole bunch of new services available, one of which is called Traffic Manager. And people say, well, what's Traffic Manager? I can spin up websites, for instance, in multiple data centers. So let's say I put one in U.S. West, I put one in U.S. East, I put one in Europe, I put one in APAC, uh, what we call APAC, over in uh, Singapore or Tokyo or in Japan. I can then put in front of it one service called Traffic Manager and I can say, based on, uh, you know, manage the work, uh, or manage the uh, traffic flow for this website at this URL, and send the traffic to the nearest data center so that a person in Tokyo is going to see the servers over in, in Asia while West Coast US see the West Coast and the East Coast see the East Coast and Europe sees Europe. But then if we lose one of those data centers, the traffic manager says, oh, that one's down. I'm going to go ahead and just use the other three. And it does automatic load balancing which is really amazing when you really think about that. And I do believe that's actually a service you can put in front of on-prem applications even. So, so how how does that work on a, on, on more of a technical level? Because like you know DNN, you got the file system that's easy enough to serve for multiple locations, but you know you got the database as well. Um, and so when you got people coming to different data centers uh, using that type of service, you know how does that impact the DNN side? So uh, I haven't personally tried it yet. I'm, this is actually something I'm going to be trying on my site just to try it. Uh, what you can actually do is the uh, new SQL PaaS offerings is it has geo replication. So you can actually say, I want this database in these data centers, and oh, by the way, this is going to be the master copy. So all master writes would come to that, and then it would get written to the other databases, and they're expanding on that capability for geo-replication uh, further and further. Um, I haven't, like I said, I haven't personally played with it yet, so I haven't figured out what's its, uh, what's its weaknesses and what's its strengths, but... The, the, it has a capability for geo-replication, both for a disaster, if you will, so you can have one running in another data center anyways, and if one data center fails, it'll fail over. But how can we utilize that in the case of, uh, in the case of running DNN on different continents? We're running into uh, uh, that with several of our applications internally. We're trying to figure out how to do that and best replicate that around the world. So, so does somebody have to do something to make that happen, or, or is, is that part of the service where I say I need to be geolocated, and now the data is just replicated? That's part of the service. Okay, so, so what you would say is that's hashtag awesome. Yes, I would say that's hashtag awesome, <laughs> personally. Um, when, it, when it comes to a lot of these services, we understand, you know, the, the nice thing that Microsoft has when you think about all the cloud vendors is we not only think about what you know, developers need. We think about what enterprise needs. And part of enterprise needs is geo-replication. It is, uh, you know, backups. It's, it's everything. It's how do we make a company run, where a lot of the other cloud providers, they aren't thinking full, that fully yet. And, you know, we're, we're slowly but surely moving to make it a more, uh, uh, an experience that's easier for both the operations team as well as the uh, application development team. You know, speaking so, of making making it easy for the enterprise, one of the areas that I've really been impressed with Azure and the, and the work uh, Microsoft has done is in the scripting side of the house. You know, the ability to, to run a PowerShell script and control virtually any aspect of, of Azure. H have you had much experience doing that or, or playing with those? Oh, yeah. Things? Yes, PowerShell. I, uh, I recommend it to any... 
uh, uh, Windows administrators or people that are going to be doing a lot of things in Windows or SQL or other Microsoft server platforms that I might have to have to manage. Share uh, the the whole you know being able to share out PowerShells and utilize PowerShell scripts for everything is amazing. I will say one of the things, and, and Will might be able to talk to this, we have our own internal uh, Windows Azure Pack portal, which we get servers from for one of our data centers. I can actually script a server build from Windows Azure Pack where it deploys the server, gets it set up as we need it, our configuration as far as drive size, that side, uh, and uh, you know CPU and memory, and then deploy code onto it and then bring it into a SharePoint farm. We have the capability to do that as a fully ve uh, fully run SharePoint or a PowerShell script to deploy that. So I heavily use PowerShell. I'm I'm still learning it, and it changes every single time we have a release. Um, and it changes for the better. And the great thing is, a lot of information is out there. If you follow people like Jeffrey Snover, uh, you can get a ton of PowerShell. And the great thing about it is PowerShell is so powerful. I even know uh, developers that are building PowerShell systems because it's so powerful. Um, uh, 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 Garrett, I can't think of Garrett's last name. They're actually building, uh, it's basically like AppGet in uh, Linux. They're building that into, uh, into PowerShell and into Windows Server. So you can actually say, uh, go get... Uh, SQL Server and have it installed and have it install you know just from a PowerShell script because it's that powerful. Yeah, I, I used it uh, at DNNCon. We had to spin up like 60 servers for training. Uh, Will Will remembers this. Uh, <laughs> a couple of PowerShell scripts. We spun up all the servers, spun up all the SQL Server instances, had the remote desktop uh, RDP files ready. Um, and it was all PowerShell. I couldn't have done it without without PowerShell being able to control all of that. And, and, and to add on to that, like we had problems with that because the you know he, he he did that once, but then we realized we didn't provision enough of those. And so like on a whim, like I had to con call him, and, and he's like he's eating breakfast or something. Like hey dude, we need I don't know what it was like uh, 30 more of these, and and I need them now. And and you know five minutes later, there they are, and our students are using them. So it, it was very very powerful. Create dash lab environment, right? That's a make it a standard <laughs> command, and then put in the number of machines you need. There you go. Yep, that's how DNN DNNCon training happens. So for anybody that attended, um, you know, that's the magic behind the scenes. Uh, that was really nice. So, so one of the things I wanted to kind of focus back in on is this, so like kind of some of the beginning stuff. So if somebody wants to, um, you know, well. One of the things we've known about for a while is, is the uh, Windows Azure Accelerator for DNN that uh, David Rodriguez uh, maintains, right? And, and so that's one way that I've gone and put something into Azure that's DNN. Uh, but you're saying that platform as a service, we can just go in there and choose it now. Um, uh, is, is there like a preferred way for somebody that wants to get started with this that maybe doesn't have uh, a prior Azure experience? I would uh, honestly have people start, go to azure.com and you can cre create a free trial and it gives you 30 days and $200 worth of credit. I would just start making things. Um, I, I, you know, I'm lucky enough, and, and for those of you that have, uh, for, for, for those developers that have MSDN accounts, your MSDN account comes with Azure credits as well. So for instance, I have uh, what would be probably, I think it's the highest or second highest level as a Microsoft employee MSDN account. So I get $150 a credit a month that I can go in and play. And I've, I've set up servers. I've tried this. I've tried that. Um, uh, uh, I have a podcast, uh, another podcast that I help uh, semi-co-produce um, for a couple of guys here at uh, Microsoft. And I tried spinning up an IRC server so that we could set up chat in IRC instead of uh, using this hokey website that they uh, set up on. Now uh, that, that one's moving on to Channel 9, so that'll be interesting because we have full support from Microsoft, so it's an interesting change. But you can go in there. You, I would say start out with a PaaS. It's the easiest way to spin something up. You click one button, takes a couple minutes, and all of a sudden you have a, you have a .NET Nuke website right there. Boom. Um, I can't remember what the current version is right now. I could look that up real quick. But it's, you, it, you know, it's real quick, and it makes it easy for uh, someone trying something new. And I would... Um, I highly recommend it because it's the uh, it's the easiest way. The next easiest would be to um, 
to uh, set up a couple IaaS servers. You set up a web server and a SQL server, then you can try it there. Um, that gets a little bit more technical because you have to figure networking, virtual servers can be a, it can be a little bit more. Um, if you're more uh, infrastructure uh, directed, it's great because you can learn all about the infrastructure, creating private networks, creating the gateway. You can even set up a, a site-to-site VPN so that the actual .NET nuke is not available to the uh, general public on the internet. You can actually go and look. Uh, you can go and uh, uh, view it on your site-to-site VPN, or you can even do what they call client-to-site VPN. So you can actually get a a, a, a VPN client that'll work on all computers, and then you're just working in the cloud. So those are a couple of easy ways to get into it. So are there any, like, for, you know, a lot of our audience would obviously be developers. Are there any, like, uh, well, I know the answer to this, but, but uh, <laughs> it would be nice for everybody to know the answer to this. Are there, are, are, are there any, like, useful ways that you could think of where a developer might want to not just host their website in Azure, but they might want to maybe use some Azure extensibility and build something in DNN against it? You know, that's a great point. Uh, one of the huge things that I would point a uh, developer to and operations people is utilizing the Application Insights system. Uh, application Insights will give the uh, dev or an operations team deep insight. And I wish I could show you. I actually have it set up on my site using some content injection uh, module that I happen to find online. I don't know who might make a content <laughs> injection module. <laughs> But I was able to inject in, there's just a simple uh, piece of code that you inject in, and I get tons of data showing uh, what's going on on my site, and one of the one of the things I always laugh at is the uh, browser that hits my site the most is Chrome, which I'm like, really? <laughs> I have more Chrome people visiting. I know, you think more Microsoft people would look at my site, but you know. Well, you know, um, developers tend to go to Chrome. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But I also see, for instance, I'm looking. I'm looking at my statistics right now. Over the past uh, seven days, I've had 35 people from the U.S., seven people from China, six people from Brazil. Those are the top sessions by country. I have that kind of data. I can actually click in and get detailed data, watching someone click the links on the site and where they went and how long it took each page to load. It's nice. amazing the level of detail you can get from Application Insights. So that can actually really drive developers or admins to uh, improve the performance of their site. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm looking at some things of saying, hey, I can do some things here. Another big one is something that came out recently, and I'm trying to remember who made the module, but you can use, uh, uh, Azure has a Redis cache system now, which allows you to cache a whole bunch of the pages into a, uh, into a system where it, it validates, has this page changed? Nope, okay, serve the cache page. So it pre-builds a lot of those pages and makes it really fast for the uh, end user. And I know someone's built an actual uh, cache um, connector uh, module. I'm trying to remember. I know Will's probably knows who I'm talking about. I haven't. I, I Joe knows better than I do. I was going to let Joe say it. Okay. Yeah. So David Rodriguez, who's uh, who's an yeah. Azure MVP, uh, works on our cloud team here at Denon Corp. Uh, actually wrote the Redis caching provider. Uh, for DNN, so you can you can drop that in place of the existing caching provider, uh, and it'll it'll start using the the Azure Redis cache. Um, so we've gone back and forth on a few features of that and how those should operate. And, and you know, David's just a a little a little uh, gremlin cranking out code all the time, and and you know, so this is one of one of the many uh, Azure pieces that he's cranked out. I, I will admit it's some great uh, stuff that he's doing. I have a uh, person that works for me. He doesn't, unfortunately, he uses one of those other blogging platforms, but he uses the Redis cache on uh, on uh, Azure, and it's amazing the performance it gives him. And and he had to actually he had to use the Redis cache because all the other caching systems for that other platform uh, just would not work for him. So. I, I, I highly recommend Redis as a good system for uh, for folks, especially for high volume sites. Yeah. So it's about time that we start to sign off here. Um, so the uh, 
I guess I guess the rule of thumb here is if you want to get started trying this stuff out, go to Azure.com, set up a free trial. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's other ways as well. So like if you want, if you have an MSDN account, or if you, you know, this might be an excuse to actually purchase one finally. Um, you know, those are ways to get into it. And and uh, also, uh, you know, BizSpark, for example. Uh, Very much, you know, yeah. Hotcakes is part of BizSpark, and, and, and that comes up with uh, comes with MSDN credits as well, and, and so that's what we use to test against Azure for our development team. Is is you know they set up a site and, and make sure everything runs okay uh, as well, and so you know, there's multiple ways to get into it. Um, and of course, we'll put provide links to all that stuff on the show notes as well. Yep. The other the other one I'll say is if you're working with a Microsoft partner or if you're working with Microsoft in general, um, in and if you have some sort of open or uh, enterprise agreement, get Azure credits included. Um, I'll I'll say this kind of what what I hear from the field, our salespeople are just throwing them in trying to get certain sales numbers hit, and they're offering deep discounts. So it's a good way if you're if you're doing some negotiating on an EA, have them throw in some Azure credits, and you, you'd be amazed at what you can do. Great tip. <laughs> all right. So uh, part of this, well, first of all, thank you for all this great information, insight. Uh, uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, you know, there's, it's not very many people in the world that you can ask this many pointed questions on any technology to, and, and so we really appreciate you spending the time to uh, share your knowledge with our audience. Um, and uh, the the next uh, hangout, it's going to be probably the first week of next month, but we are looking for uh, more speakers for next month and, and beyond, so if you're interested, please let us know. Um, and we also are going to end up having a virtual conference. We're going to have many speakers all at once, and so if you can give us some early indication as to whether or not you'd like to be a speaker for a virtual conference that's going to be presented very much the same way, uh, that'd be great as well. Um, the and, uh, and also, if you'd like your site featured in one of our future broadcasts uh, as a Side of the month, uh, please uh, let us know of those. We got a couple in the queue, but uh, you know we we uh, are always looking for new uh, sites as well as speakers. Uh, and don't forget about DNN Connect. It's uh, registrations going quick, so you know you're you're losing uh, you're you're about to lose some uh, lose a spot if you don't register soon. And then of course I got that user group uh, uh, meeting myself next month if you're in the Fresno area. Uh, do you guys have any uh, any um, last minute event announcements or uh, you know places people can find you or anything like that? Yeah, I don't have any. Go ahead, Jared. Oh, I was just going to say you can uh, follow me on Twitter at jshock is my uh, Twitter handle. I've been a little quiet lately because I've been going through a little bit of a job transition here, um, but I tweet about a lot of things, DNN, uh, technology in general. I might go ranting off on something else. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I try. I try to keep it uh, technology focused, but. Uh, um, and the other thing you'll see a lot from me is beer, because I, I do a lot of craft beer. In fact, uh, there's a craft beer um, uh, contest or uh, gathering here in Seattle in, uh, next weekend, and I'm taking my uh, bourbon barrel scotch ale to it. Oh. oh. <laughs> Where is that again? <laughs> it's in Seattle. So anytime, hey, Will, anytime you come up here, I'm a part of a group of guys called Beer Team 6, and we brew our own beer. I'll take you over. I'll show you the process, and we can actually uh, have some wonderful beers. Oh, you, you have me at bourbon. <laughs> 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 How about you, Joe? Yeah, no, I'm not, not the big bourbon guy, but uh, I'll definitely take you up on that offer, Jared. Uh, I come through come through Seattle quite often. When I go up to uh, to our Vancouver office, I usually fly through uh, fly through Seattle and uh, drive up. So hit me up. <laughs> All right, so open invitation for us too. We won't tell everybody else. It'll be our secret. Our secret. <laughs> Nobody else will know. Exactly. Wait a minute. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, Jerry, for spending time with us, and, and thank you, Joe. It's uh, been a great hangout, and I look forward to next month again. Yes, look forward to seeing everyone next month. Thanks, Jared. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>